Joining us now here in studio for the debate, Bill Curry, he's vice chair and America's managing director at Deloitte. Ann Golden, president and CEO at the Conference Board of Canada. Michael Marin, Action Canada Fellow and lecturer at the University of Ottawa. Armin Yalnesian, Senior Economist at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And we welcome back Jim Milway, Executive Director of the Institute for Competitiveness and Prosperity at the University of Toronto. Okay, good to see everybody around this table. Ann Golden, you've been on this show how many times? <laughs> but never times. here in the studio. I think you've almost always been on the line. Ottawa, right? Nice to have you here. Thank you. I want to show a couple of graphs just before we start our discussion in hopes of uh, helping to get you go. Here's. Um, the prosperity gap, Mr. Milway, is not the only gap that has emerged in the last 15 to 20 years. We're going to talk income gaps as well. Follow the, uh, the dancing red line, as it were, and you can see that uh, as we track income inequality around 1996, that line really started to go north, rising sharply. That's income inequality in Canada. And Michael, I think we've got one more graph we want to show as well. Here's our income inequality, Canada versus the rest of the world. Our inequality gap in relation to the OECD countries, we used to have greater income equality than our OECD peers, but that red Canadian line, as you can see, is now higher than the rest of the so-called Western nations in the world. We're not doing as well on that as we used to be. And I guess, Anne, I want to start with you. Can you help explain why those lines are going the way they're going? Well, we actually released a report this year and built on some of the work that Armin and others here had done. Uh, what it shows is that uh, uh, it's really about salaries, not asset appreciation, and compensation is the issue. And it has, in the 90s, there was a huge jump in the spread. So the, the stat I think that's most impressive is that virtually one, uh, all of the new wealth that was created in the three-year three -year period from 1976 on virtually all of it went to the top 20 percent of the population and one-third of it went to the top one percent. Now that's a function of a lot of reasons but it's largely compensation decisions. Bill, you want to uh, agree, disagree, challenge, leave alone? What's your view on that? So I've looked at the data, I think the data is what it is and it suggests that that is a fact that we, ex we live with today. Is that the way it ought to be? I don't think it's the way it ought to be. I actually think the reason we are where we are today has got a historic base. I think that we hid behind a 65 cent dollar in a U.S. free trade agreement for many years. We didn't invest in our businesses. Our productivity fell behind and we left a cohort of Canadians unable to earn um, higher salary increases over that period of time, which puts us where we are today. Armin, help us out with this. Uh, some of the period in question, we had pretty good economy here in this country. How does a robust period economically lead to greater income inequality if the theory is that a rising tide lifts all boats? Yeah, well, we've had 30 years of uh, evidence on whether trickle-down theory really works. And trickle-down is about giving people at the top more money so that they can invest and create jobs, which Canada did in big spades. It did grow the economy from 1997 to 2007 more rapidly than at any period since the 1960s. And Canada in that decade, compared to the rest of the G7, was actually the job juggernaut of hmm. the advanced industrialized nations. We did a great job of creating jobs, but inequality widened. Why is that? Well, yesterday the OECD put out a report looking at exactly those issues, and it showed that in fact um, both institutionally, the way we do our regulations and how we protect employment, um, the decline in union density, the uh, ability to hire people more easily on a temporary basis, and of course temporary workers are unable to a extract benefits from working because they don't have the employment relationship with their employer. All these institutional factors combined and collided with two other things that governments do. One is how they support people when they're unemployed. Um, so social protections were eroded very dramatically in the mid-1990s in Canada, which is why you see Canada having better inequality up till the mid-1990s and worse after. And of course tax policies have put a premium on tax cuts. Well, who is the biggest beneficiary of tax cuts? Those who pay the most taxes. So you get both taxes and social protections eroded um, in this period and it has widened inequality in this country at a rate we have never seen in our history going right back to the 1920s. I told Jim we'd get back to this eventually but, but uh, hold off one more second because Michael I want to hear from you on this. Are we an unambiguously less just, less equal society today as a result of the numbers that we've seen here? Well I, I think that the numbers that we're seeing are actually the result of a philosophical problem in our, our economic policy and Jim mentioned productivity innovation. Traditionally the way that we think about these things is that we need prosperity in order to deal with issues like poverty and inequality. Actually, I think we have that the other way around. 
I think we need to deal with issues like poverty and equality so that we can prosper. Uh, Jim mentioned the knowledge-based economy. That means that your wealth and your income comes from uh, the skills and abilities of your people. And we know that rising inequality, particularly Canada's persistently high poverty levels, are detrimental to things like educational outcomes, health out outcomes. So I think fundamentally we need a shift in uh, the way we think about these issues. Uh, we need to see issues like poverty and equality not as just social issues, but fundamentally any, uh, economic issues that uh, can uh, hurt our prosperity in the long term. Let me just share one more chart with you, and then, Jim, I'll get you to comment on this, and we'll go around on this. Uh, we've heard a lot lately about the 1% mm -hmm. and the other 99%. And if we want to put some more meat on the bone here, Michael, if you would, let's bring this up. Here is share of income gains, the top 1% earners in Canada, looking back over the past, uh, well, s almost century or so. From uh, in the 1920s, in the roaring 20s, 17%. Uh, of the top 1%, they, the, the top 1 earners in Canada made 17% of the money. Go on to 1967, our centennial year was down to 8%. How about 10 years later? Moving up to 11%. From 97 to 2007, almost a third. Um, so that's the stuff. That's the key actually, stuff. can I correct the way you interpreted those numbers? Sure. Because they're generated from uh, Michael Veal's information, which I published last yeah. this time last year. What did I get and wrong about it? It's the share of growth, not the share of total income. Oh, forgive so me. when okay. the economy grows, how much does the top one percent right. get? Sure. And we've never seen it at such a big piece of taking taking the gains from growth. There we go. As that's in the last gen. How, last how would you know that? This is only your study. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jim, is this the way it should be? I don't know. Uh, I'll be happy to talk about you know, how poverty is an important uh, factor in our economic performance and how we can get poverty down. Uh, but inequality, I don't know. What's the right number? What's the right uh, Gini number that people are shooting for? I know that more GDP and more income is better on average. And the better it's shared, the better. And to the extent we can get low-income Canadians and Ontarians out of poverty, I'm happy. But uh, the fact that uh, OECD report there was a tiny little increase in Gini yesterday, uh, I just don't know what to do with that. I do know that all the action uh, happened in the 90s and that since 2000, uh, the inequality number has been flat as a pancake. So I, I'm not quite sure what uh, the hue and cry is uh, today and yesterday about these, um, uh, these great uh, increases in Gini when it, it, it went up a little bit after going down a little bit the year before. Genie is the first graph we showed, the That's right. inequality numbers. Okay, and you wanted to add? I do a couple of points. Um, first, I think the reason why there's such a hue and cry today, even though in fact the huge growth in inequality goes back a decade, is because of what's is is because the current crisis that people are in. If you look at what's happening on these protests that have you know jumped from the U.S. around the world, what people are saying is that wait a second, there's all this unemployment. I'm no better off and all the people that caused the problem are getting these astronomical growth in wealth. So I think it's the juxtaposition or the convergence mm -hmm. of the injustice they feel. That's what's causing the emotional reaction. Um, the metaphor that, that, that I, in my head that or when I'm speaking that I like to use is that what's happening in, in, in today's society, partly linked to the knowledge economy, is that the yachts are rising faster than the, than the rowboats. <laughs> and uh, I think it is a problem for the economy. Interestingly enough, in the last 10 years, we're starting to see kind of conservative businessy-like organizations like the IMF coming out and saying things like, wait a second, it's better for sustainable prosperity. When they actually look at the growth records, prosperity is more sustainable with somewhat greater equality. No one is looking for perfect equality. Like Jim, I wouldn't choose a specific Gini coefficient number to hang my hat on. But right now, the jump is too great. One other key stat that we, would be great if we had a chart, and this comes, I think the most important stat that came out of the OECD study put out yesterday, is that our tax and benefit systems used to modify or moderate 70% of the growth in inequality. Since we've made the tax changes and other changes, it now only moderates 40%. Which means that the government has less ability to... We're not, we're, I would put it this way, we're, we're, we're using our tax and benefits system less to uh, blunt the harsh edges of capitalism gotcha. than we used to. Jim? But as the OECD pointed out, most of that was the way we've changed our benefits and taxation was played a minor role in that uh, going from 70 to 40. So it's more of a question Benef of how benefits. we've designed benefits. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm sure we'll get into it, but taxes are not a big part of this story. Bill, anything troubling to you about the numbers on that chart? So only, I guess the, um, 
The thing I would look at in this entire thing is that I think historically we've had issues. I think that there have been policy decisions made to address those issues. I think they're imperfect and there's more room to grow. I think for all boats to rise, we need to be focusing on the future and creating an economy that's innovative, built on knowledge-based jobs, not built on you know, pure commodity extraction and manual labor. And I think that that's sort of the, the direction we would take. Okay, follow up here. The, the productivity and innovation <coughs> gaps I think I understood you correctly to say, are getting wider as the income inequality is also getting wider. Are those things related? I think so. But so I think the reason is, is that we have a cohort of Canadians who are being dislocated by normal market forces, right? Some manufacturing jobs that are historically high value jobs, um, often unionized, have been sent to other mm -hmm. jurisdictions. And those companies and those employees have been left behind mm -hmm. when they re-enter the workforce, it's very difficult for them, as hard a workers as they are, to find the same level of income as they enjoyed historically. So there is a dislocation. So in Ontario, they have a choice. They can go and find the latest manufacturing company to come to Ontario, and there are some, or they can move to Alberta and go work on the oil sands. But there's a fundamental dislocation. Either they move, they get lucky and find a manufacturing job, or they take a, a, a role that doesn't pay as well. Michael, right? it's just the way it is. Well, I'm going to take a little bit of a d different spin on it. So um, with these trends, a lot of the focus has been on the top 1%, top 10%. I think what we actually need to be concerned about as well is the fact that the bottom 80%, their share of income, uh, has been declining. Bottom 60% incomes have been stagnating. Mm -hmm. That's the majority of our workforce, and they're not seeing the benefits of our economic growth. And that's a serious problem um, because we know that human capital outcomes, things like education and health, are very much tied to socioeconomic status, family income. But on top of that, I think we need to be concerned about it from a political standpoint as well. We're seeing backlashes in the United States, backlashes in Europe uh, against this type of, of inequality. And I don't think it's just a coincidence that the countries uh, in Europe that are seeing a lot of instability are actually the most unequal countries uh, in Europe. Um, so we have to be concerned about it in the long term, both from an economic standpoint and a political standpoint. I want to wave a big red flag in front of your face right now. I th let me try this. I'm not advancing this. I'm putting it out there as a question. Are the 1% doing so much better more recently because they're working harder? They're doing things that the market and our economy appreciate more. Uh, they're more productive. They're more innovative. And therefore, they deserve to do better. So we've always had people with the royal jelly in our midst. And they've always been compensated at a much higher rate than most of us around the table. There's a couple of people that I would exclude from that. You want to name names? <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is that people at the top now are getting way more money than they used to. The ratios of CEOs to the average worker have exploded just in the last eight years from about 100 to 1 but you know to about 155 to 1. And you have to ask yourself, is the person at the top really worth that much more, that much more quickly? And the answer comes from a couple of different things. One of them is forms of compensation, but other is this wave of corporate consolidation that we're going through. So there's fewer players that are taking up bigger and bigger market shares. And these CEOs are able to command much larger, and, and the cohorts around them, it isn't just the CEO. But they're not the top 1%. They're the top 1,000th of a percent. Mm. In okay. Canada, to be part of the top 1%, you've got to make 169000 a year, mm -hmm. which may be a lot less than people assume mm -hmm. if you're in the top 1%. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with that ex expression of, what do you mean that's the top 1%? That's not very rich. Well, in Canada, that, in fact, if you exclude capital gains, it is 170,000. If you include capital gains, it's about 200,000, and you're in the top ballpark pre-tax. you're not a millionaire. You're definitely not a millionaire. We only have 17,000 people that make a million dollars every year. I'm not talking about assets. I'm talking about how much income they make. And it goes to what Anne was saying earlier. We value the work of different people very differently today than we did before. We've got a whole pack of people that were, are considered disposable. But let me just go to what Mike said in terms of social unrest. Most of Canadians are better educated than a, a, a generation ago, than even 15 years ago. And most young families have got two people working, not one, compared to a generation ago. Incomes of the average family raising kids is no higher than it was in the 1980s. And yet you've got two people working, and they've invested a lot of time and money in getting educated. Now, we want economic growth. I want economic growth, because as um, 
you know, just try and get better equality without growth. And I don't agree with you that uh, it doesn't matter what the Gini coefficient number is, but I do matter. I, I, I just do tell agree me what with you. The right number is. I do agree with you that it isn't about the level; it's about the direction, and we're heading in the wrong direction. So the acid test, in the wake of all of these studies, for any government is: name your policy, whatever your policy is. Is it making things better, or is it making things worse? And here we have a government of Canada that has consistently made things mm -hmm. worse. Well, that's, uh, listen, I'm not going to defend the current government, but let's mm -hmm. let's make sure we're talking facts. Nothing's happened to that Gini number since about 2000. So this is not something that this current government has done. And believe me. I'm not defending the current government, but it's just Which nice to have some facts on the table. Federally or provincially, when you talk about the current well, government? Well, the, the numbers you showed up were national. Okay, so the current so conservative government federally uh, okay. haven't had any impact on these Gini numbers. Okay. Well, well, if we put ourselves in the position of someone who used to have a high-paying manufacturing job, uh, let's say, and, and, and they, got, uh, they got laid off. So while their skills are no longer rewarded in the job market and they're either unemployed or earning less, um, our tax and benefit system is less generous. Right. On top of that, uh, they struggle for access to things like retraining and education. So they end up in a vicious human capital cycle that can be extremely frustrating for them, but also hurts us in the long term. And we have an aging population, mm -hmm. uh, a very low birth rate. We can't afford to let anyone fall into that cycle. Okay, so let me put the productivity issue, if I can, back okay. on the table here, because creating a, mil a more skilled workforce is probably you know, one of the best ways to get a more productive work for, workforce, more innovation Absolutely. gains. I see Jim nodding his Absolutely. head, you like. Okay, Bill, does this favor, that approach then, does it favor some parts of the workforce over others? So it does today. So I think, I think you know, the worker that you described, and I, and I agree with you, those disaffected, you know, angry, looking for a way, worked hard their entire lives, made a good living, and the, the world changed, right? And so I think for those people, again, I agree, what do we do around retraining? Do we make sure they're the right social safety nets in place? Do we support them to relocate where there are jobs that they're um, just trained to do in demand versus where they may live today? So I think that there are things we need to do that are defensive. I think the place that we fall down and what we focus on are what are we doing that's offensive? Mm. What are we doing to make sure that our training programs are in place for people so that they can learn how to be innovators and learn how to be um, successful in the new economy? What are we doing to fund early stage startups so they can employ those people that are high value? What are we doing to grow those people through their cycles so that they can be innovative and we can finance them, all of which today are issues in Canada and then around around the pop, the workforce, what are we doing to make sure our immigration system actually not only attracts the world's best immigrants, but then it takes advantage of their skills when they come to Canada? You guys actually have a, in your own study, you've got a, it sounds like Jesse Jackson with all the poetry in there about educate, innovate, incubate. All what of was those it? things, yes. Yeah, what was the five other, the five other as well, yeah. <laughs> it does sound, sounded like a sister soldier moment there for a second. <laughs> anyway. Do you want to you, you want to tell us what some of the other four are? Uh, sure. So, <laughs> except you're going to make me memorize them, and I don't have them memorized actually. So we we are about um, immigration education. We think there's opportunities to improve. No, it has education. to end in ATE to make this work uh, poetic. Uh, educate, educate. Immigrate, educate. Innovate. Innovate. Uh, immigrate. Um, <laughs> incubate. 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 Innovate. 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 Yeah, there's about eight of them. <laughs> anyway, that's the gist of it. Armin. Okay, I can tell that nobody at this table is going to be a new rap star in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody. That's why I say it. <laughs> but I, I just. I just want to comment about how much emphasis we're putting on innovation and technology and skills upgrading as if it's the supply side of the equation that has fallen down on the job. Some, in some aspects that's true because you know employers all over the country are saying we ha I have a labor shortage in skilled uh, jobs, I can't find people with the appropriate training. Well, employers have always said that, and they've provided mm -hmm. on-the-job training, which is something that most employers don't want now. Many employers are turning to temp agencies and temporary foreign workers to meet their skill shortages instead of training up people that come out of and school. And they do that because? Well, because it's faster. They don't have to pay for it. Faster, cheaper, easier, for the employer. more flexible for the employer. But let me just say that if you don't address the demand side, which is good jobs being and the OECD report yesterday mentioned this, if you don't address good jobs being created that pay good wages, mm -hmm. you're missing the boat on what Mr. Henry Ford told us in the 1920s, that if you want to grow your economy, people have to have both the money and the time to buy stuff. And if you are ignoring 60% of your population whose wages are growing, mm -hmm. you know that 60% of the economy is run on consumption, you can't go on the fumes of the top 10%. You need to give people better wages. And that's when we, that brings us full circle into the productivity question, which as you identified in the opening interview, Jim, part of productivity is doing things more efficiently, which sometimes means laying people off yes. and paying them less. That 
is coherent for the employer. It is not coherent for the macro economy as a whole. Would what you agree with that? I'd agree with. I think you're putting way too much emphasis, like you did in your in your original question, that it, productivity isn't about laying people off, and, and it's not about paying them less. Productivity is per hour worked. So. Productivity, a productivity agenda wants higher wages and higher profits, both. And in fact, most of GDP goes to wages, not to profits. So productivity isn't about finding ways to get cheaper workers. It's to get more value out of the work hours that we're putting in place. It doesn't sound but like you... today we can have our cake and eat it too, though. It in sounds what way? Like, well, you talked about business having to do well, but employees have to be doing well as well. Right. Except today, it just seems as if business is doing well and employees are not doing as well. Uh, businesses, wage earners get most of the GDP that comes out of there. Now, we but might argue the that... the growth is going to business, not to no, workers. No, that's not true. No, um, uh, wage earners are, uh, get the higher share of, uh, of GDP. And if you go back to 1929, the, the, the share that's gotten by labor versus the share that's gotten by profits has you know, deviated a bit around a straight line that's about 50, 60 percent for wages and uh, about 10 to 20 percent for profits. But the income, the income inequality is only about all the people who are earning wages. This exactly. has nothing to do with business. This exactly. is all about the people that are earning wages from the top floor to right. the shop floor. Uh, and to me, when you think about what we can do about it, there's two questions you ask. First of all, do the people earning the max, and we're talking about the top say one-third of one percent even, that are, are the figures that are always quoted in the paper, mm -hmm. do they deserve it? And part of the political obstacle is the sense that they're the ones that have come up with the ideas, they're the ones who've made the jobs possible, they're the ones that you know, deserve it. Uh, that, part, that point of view, I think, is difficult to agree with. Um, and a lot of the salaries, the peop going back to the protests and the, the uh, uh, discontent over this, is because so many of the high salaries were in the investment sector, where it doesn't appear that they deserved it at all. Uh, yeah, they in other came words, up with these cockamamie instruments that well, they're the ones who created the destruction, yeah. not the ones who created the solutions. Yeah. Anyway, so in terms of how we go forward with this, I actually do think we can have have it all. I do think that the answers are not contradictory. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the answers? Part of for Canada uh, is is, and I didn't think we'd get there today, but sh surely it's around investment and investment in infrastructure. We're being held back as a country through this growing and gigantic infrastructure gap on all fronts. So if you just take infrastructure in transportation, which is the, and the OECD reports confirmed what we've been putting out in Canada, uh, huge obstacles. Um, but at the same time, they disadvantage the poor and the lower class, the lower income groups disproportionately. Hmm. Um, so that would be so investment in education, but not just it's everything from lifelong learning and retraining all the way to how we the, we create the curriculum in our schools. Um, will there be salary market adjustment? That's another route in. Let me, let me follow up with Bill yeah. on that. And it, trust me, I'm not trying to demonize you with this question, okay? But the reality is, you're the only corporate executive around the table here today, so you get this. You're you're, you're part of the one percent. I get to ask you this question: Do, do the people who earn high incomes? Who are your colleagues, presumably, at companies like yours and others? Do they feel they're earning their keep? They're entitled to these high salaries because of whatever productivity improvements they make in our society? Yes, I think absolutely that they believe they earn the incomes that they have. In my firm, you know, we operate in 160 countries. We have 180,000 people. We compete globally, competitively with people around the world. And so our benchmarks are not Canada, right? And so, you know, That's in it. order to do global jobs in our global firm. You compete globally for, for talent. Are, are the people who work in your company, some of whom I'm assuming are making, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a year, are they concerned about the line on that graph that we started this discussion with, that the income inequality is growing significantly lately? Absolutely. They are. Absolutely. So I actually completely agree that, you know, if you continue down a path where you have income inequality get to a point that it continues to be so disparate that it makes no sense, then you're going to have social unrest. I think it's not good for our, our country when we have a large cohort of the population that doesn't see income growth and affects optimism. I also think it's symptomatic of us not investing in our job market and not investing in our economy to improve that so that we have uh, knowledge jobs and high value jobs going forward which allow us to pay people more than they currently are. So earn. are you lobbying the hell out of government to stop reducing corporate hmm. taxes? <laughs> you know we actually think that corporate taxes in Canada are competitive where they are today, right? We you mean would, they don't need to be cut further? I think that they've been stabilized, the government has set its direction and we've been supportive of that. I think if you look at our literature there's we're, we look at tax things like incentives for angel investors who are people who put money into small startups. We look at um, 
tax opportunities around research and development, tax credits, et cetera. But I don't think you'll see, and lowering long-term, lowering uh, personal tax rates are in some of our literature, but I don't think you'll see anything around corporate taxes. One more question to you. Can taxes go higher? In Canada? Yeah. I don't mean just business taxes. I mean personal income taxes, the HST, corporate income taxes. Can, I, we, can I we put them up? I honestly don't know. I, like, I literally have not done the analysis. It would be a total guess, and I would come from a place where you know, I would naturally say no, but I don't have any fact base to support that. So I would actually defer to others who might be more Okay, Michael, let me start with you, and then I'll go, to, we'll go around on this one. Uh, there are lots of R&D tax credits out there to encourage businesses to invest in that. We now have the harmonized sales tax, which is business-liked as well. We have corporate income taxes, which I'm told are extremely competitive now with our neighboring jurisdictions. Is all this good? It's good, uh, but it's incomplete. Um, and I think to the extent that it takes away from our ability to invest in people, which I think ultimately is where innovation comes from, uh, then we're going to need to recalibrate our, our priorities. It, uh, just explain that. It takes away from our ability to invest in people because it deprives our governments of the money they need to invest in people? It, uh, it could, um, and, uh, and that's a problem. But I think more fundamentally, um, in terms of our priorities going forward, we really need to invest in things like uh, income uh, security, make sure that we have proper employment uh, protection legislation. You know, uh, aside from the United States, we have the weakest employment protection legislation of any developed country in the world. And we talked about retraining uh, earlier. I actually think that these uh, uh, two issues, employment protection and income security, are very much linked to the incentive that employers have to retrain their workers. One of the reasons why countries like uh, Denmark and the Netherlands, for example, are able to combine very generous income uh, security programs with low levels of both youth and overall unemployment is because that long-term attachment that workers have with their employers encourages them to invest in upskilling uh, workers and drives productivity in the long term. Armin, you want to piggyback on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think Michael's really put his name on, on what this problem is going forward. And in fact, you take a look at how much of the infrastructure that you were talking about in human capital has been offloaded to his generation and how much debt has been incurred. And yet the premium, the return on that has been eroded. Why? Because almost all of the job growth in the private sector since the Great Recession of 2008-9 has occurred through temporary and contract work for that, that gentleman's generation. Going forward, the next generation that has invested so heavily in improving their ca human capital, they're not going to see the same returns if we think that the appropriate way to go forward is to let businesses do what's best for the bottom line with no concern at all for what's good for the public interest well, in he, Canada. He, he, in and, fairness, he just said that high-ranking executives who are well-paid are concerned about the bigger picture yeah, in society. Have they changed employment, the employment contract pr practices? Would they actually argue to improve taxation revenues, which will help invest in the country? As Michael was saying earlier, you know, in about 15, 20 years, we're going to need every hand on deck. Mm. With, uh, but in fact, okay, part, of the, so wait, part yeah. of the solution that has been proposed right now has been simply to import guest workers, mm -hmm. essentially, to double our rate of immigration by importing guest workers. That isn't the way we built this country. Bill? So first, I would argue that the guest workers are part of our social fabric and the future and that it's very important they be successful in Canada and that we should invest in ensuring that they're successful both by um, recruiting the right people to move here and then providing infrastructure to make sure when they move here that they're able to take advantage of their own skill sets to be successful in Canada. As for business investment in human capital, you know, business isn't confused. So the demographics are what they are. They're mathematical numbers which say unless I can recruit and retain and get the most out of the brightest, most capable people I can find anywhere, I fail. So the market demand suggests that when we go recruiting, which we do in the thousands a year, you know, we are able to offer a value proposition to our employees that is compelling because we're in a knowledge-based industry. I think for all the other businesses that I'm aware of, talent is extremely high on their agenda because they would believe in you. That, you know, I need bright, capable people at any kind of industry or level in order to innovate, in order to sustain my success. So their self-interest is to actually make their human capital as effective as they can. But Jim, let me, let me ask you this. Governments of all political stripes have essentially followed the agenda you have wanted them to for the last almost a decade. They've lowered business taxes, they've got incentives there 
to get you, you know, going for the R&D expenditures that you think are important. The harmonized sales tax is in place now in Ontario and mm -hmm. Quebec and I think a bunch of other provinces as right. well, not BC admittedly. Mm -hmm. So I guess the argument is we've done our part to make it as easy for you as possible to do well so that the Treasury can be filled in order to make those investments in human capital. Have you done your part? You being business? Or? Yeah. Um, it's hard to say we're in the middle of a recession uh, and um, businesses aren't feeling too good about investing these days. Um, I think that it's a little too early to make any conclusions about the corporate tax reductions. For example, they're not all the way through yet in Ontario or uh, federally, I don't think. So um, uh, anybody who studied the issue and looked across country and across time and, and, and you know, held for various variables that are going on uh, always conclude that uh, if you lower the tax on business investment, uh, you will get more investment. That's kind of uh, supply and, therefore and demand. And more revenue. And well, yes, more revenue. I think more revenue comes from just a more robust economy. Mm -hmm. We don't have right now uh, the, the re any revenue problem we have now has got nothing to do with rates. It's all to do with economic activity. When you're in a recession, uh, your your revenue gov revenue to the coffers goes down. I mean, so lowering the rates isn't going to help you guys then, right? Until there's the rates. Uh, well, lowering the rates will help business. Will will um, make it easier for businesses to see the benefit of making an investment in technology, and therefore they will invest more. Uh, that's the logic, and that's what's been proved out in various studies over time. That if you lower taxes on business investment, you'll get more business. And investment. are you using your more robust bottom lines right now to reinvest right now, in no. innovation? No, right no, now, no, right now, businesses are sitting on tons of cash, um, and but so I don't think we ought to uh, decide on a policy based on one year. Just let me uh, correct the record. Uh, we're we're no big fans at the institute for uh, for the uh, tax credits on R and D. They don't work. Um, you know, we have the most generous tax credits in, can in the world, or second most generous in the world, and our businesses don't invest. I think the real push or the real drive to get businesses investing is more competition. Gotcha. And uh, Just to respond to a number of points mm -hmm. that have been made around the table. Uh, our board, 35 corporate leaders, at the last board meeting a few weeks ago spent a long time talking about inequality and the impact of that on civil society and on trust. They care. Secondly. If they're not talking about that, as we do a go-around on what are the top issues for them, it's always human capital. They care. Now, the question that Armin raised, how does that actually translate into uh, co corporate policies you know, in, in each company, different by sector, different by company, but definitely um, they really care and understand both the connection between social cohesion and prosperity and between human talent. They care, but are prepared to put pressure on politicians to change policy mm. in order to... I Actually, dot, dot, dot. Now, it, uh, now the interesting thing is, so what to do about the problem? Everybody agrees that the tax regime has, has uh, we've done on the policy side, but on the business side, and that's, uh, we, we actually don't know what the answers are. Uh, we've just created a center for business innovation. Um, we intend to get, and this is to Where focus. Is so it's, it's a virtual center. Oh, it's, virtual. it's a virtual okay. center, uh, but it's supported by, say, both governments and major businesses who are interested, including Deloitte, by the way. Uh, they're very interested in 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 the boardroom and in the uh, within the different businesses. What can businesses actually do? Furthermore, as we were discussing before the show started, innovation is just not about these huge uh, uh, so-called you know what we think of as companies in the knowledge creation business. You know, there's innovation in how we make potatoes. There's innovation in everything. Sure. So um, we think that by sharing best practices, uh, that there's lots that the businesses can do. One final step, because we track it, is that since they have changed the tax policy, we did see a tick in the past year in the purchase of machinery and equipment. So we are seeing, it's not, you know, because of the recession, it wasn't a quick uh, turnaround, but we are seeing an uptick in Canadian corporate investment in machinery and equipment. And you, you attribute that to what? A desire to become uh, more competitive and, and, and to innovate. Usually that's linked to, it's not, it's a metaphor for innovation. Got it. Let me it's pick up on this. Stronger dollar as well. It's, I was just going to yeah, say, it probably yeah. had the, the it buck is had something to do with it. It is linked to the stronger dollar. Yeah. Yes, totally. That's right. uh, we, uh, less than 10 minutes to go here. And as we talk about whether innovation and productivity gains are helping some in society, I want to put a few demographic groups on the list here. Single parents, the disabled, First Nations, new Canadians, right. low-income people. High school dropouts. High school dropouts. Thank you, Jim. Right. The innovation and pro Michael, you first. The innovation and productivity gains that we make, are they going to get helped by those? Um, well, it depends if we have the right policies that allow them to. I mean, a few of uh, the co-panelists uh, 
mention things like uh, competition. Uh, we could add you know, free trade to those types of policies that are supposed to spur uh, greater prosperity. But I think we have to recognize that those policies also have costs. And they particularly have cost to people in these vulnerable groups. Um, I, we don't often talk about that when, uh, when we talk about um, these types of free market uh, policies. Um, and I think we do need robust responses to the, the social costs uh, to them, make sure that people can adjust to the dislocation that comes mm -hmm. from a lot of these, uh, these structural changes. I want to pick up on something that Bill mentioned, which is uh, immigration. Um, a lot of the time in our policy, the focus uh, is on attracting the, the top talent, uh, so to speak. Um, but I think that as the economy evolves, particularly uh, countries like China and India develop, it's going to be harder and harder to get them to leave uh, their countries. And if we do get them here, the fact that they're so mobile and the fact that we're not the only country that needs them, it's going to be very hard to keep them here. The fact is, though, that you know, two thirds of our uh, immigrants are in the family and economic, uh, in the family, uh, and, exactly, yeah. in refugee class. Instead of thinking of them, of them as recipients of charity, we need to think of them as people to invest in for mm. future productivity. What do we do about, I mean, everybody's in favor of more innovation and more productivity. <laughs> How do we make sure that the people that on that list I just mentioned are not left behind by it? So I actually do think that there are a cohort of Canadian society, those that you mentioned, and there could be others, where we need to have social programs. We need to have the ability to intervene in those um, constituencies to ensure that they have access to the things that they're going to need, education, health care, other things, in order to be able to thrive in what will be, hopefully, a more and more knowledge-based economy. And I think today we seem to leave them further behind instead of advancing them. So, you know, while we, we are um, unashamed, you know, around our support for business, we actually are Canadian, and there is a collectiveness that goes with being Canadian that I think is appropriate. And so I think that the social safety net around people that are disaffected, you know, should be maintained or strengthened as appropriate. Based on your experience, that's, I mean, that seems a fairly progressive view for a guy who makes his living on Bay Street. Would you say that that's widespread? I think, I think what everything you're saying is really uh, heartening to hear. I think the distinction comes from what you're saying and how that translates to corporate practice day to day who gets hired, how much they get paid, what's the nature of the employment relationship, is it long term or short term, and what's the corporate willingness to pay for the society in which we live. So just to go back to a point that Jim said, that corporate tax rates came down and somehow investment went up. In fact, corporate tax rates came down in this country and so did uh, capital investment by corporations. So that's the empirical truth in the last that's 15 years. For, no, not and 15 it did, years. It, it did pick that's up in the last year, but it's largely because of the nature. Corporate tax rates haven't come down in the last 15 years. They've come down more recently than that. And uh, we don't have the reduction in corporate taxes in place yet. So there is really no empirical evidence you can point to in Canada to make those conclusions. In fact, they go hand in hand corporate tax rates go down, so does investment. If we want to invest in the country in which we all want to live as businesses, as families, as communities, we're going to need a little bit more money to do it. Right now, our governments are talking about balancing the books. Balancing the books will come at the expense of the type of programs that support the very people you think we should be supporting more. So it's, it would be great to have corporations step up to the plate and say, this isn't the time to cut, this is the time to invest, so that we will be ready for that next inevitable phase of economic so corporate, expansion. Corporate tax rates are where right now? They're about, what Eight, is it? 17, 18 percent? 18 percent, and they're well, going to drop. and provincially, they're yeah. going to be 25 in, in 12. But at the federal level, which is where the cuts are coming, I think they're at well, they're 18. They're coming in Ontario, too. They're, they're at 16 involved. and a half right now, and they're going to be 15 percent in, in January. Where should they be? Zero. You say zero? Yeah, but then you want personal income taxes, tax cuts, too. Like, you want everything where did I say cut. That? Except where did I say that, or not? I think, you, I think you said it earlier in this conversation. I, I no, think I you said it earlier in no, this conversation. No, if you want to tax the I rich, would love if to hear you have a progressive, if, if, if your desire is to tax the rich, don't think you do that through business taxes. Business taxes are paid by workers. If you want to help workers, get rid of corporate taxes. Corporate, all corporations do is collect taxes and pass those taxes on to lower That's wages. That's like saying if you want to help workers, um, make sure that you're investing in innovations, but the flow through from those innovations have gone not even to lower wages, uh, not even to higher wages. They haven't even gone to lower prices. It used to be when we did technological innovation in the 60s and 70s, it could go to profits, wages, or cheaper prices. All we're getting is cheaper prices because it's being made elsewhere, and cheaper wages because low wages are the flip side of low prices. So just, no, cl not. just clarifying, 
if corporate tax rates go to zero, yep. do personal income taxes have to rise to uh, make Where up I would the go income? first is the HST, to be honest. I would take consumption taxes up and taxes on investment down. So. You're like uh, 999 over here, aren't you? No, no, no? I, I think um, if we want to, I, 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 could make, I could suggest some changes on the personal front. Uh, so let's tax consumption, not income. So instead of your income tax being how much did you oh. earn, it's how much did you consume. Uh, and we can have a debate as to how progressive that can be, but I just, I'm just um, uh, nervous when people say that the way to get uh, progressivity into our tax system is to tax corporations. I think it ain't it. true. But a minute and a half to go. Anne? Um, I think, to bring all sides together, uh, <laughs> just the, um, the, the, uh, the, the size of the challenge is huge. When you mention all of those groups, um, if we just look at the Aboriginal issues alone, we just mm -hmm. had a major conference in Edmonton on the North. The dominant theme was education, because the knowledge economy definitely cuts both ways. It creates opportunity, but it definitely creates a digital divide. People who don't have access or can't get access, they fall further behind, and for others, of course, it's opportunity. And they're the fastest growing demographic in the mm -hmm. country today. Right. The group we can least afford to leave behind. Ex exactly. But the immensity of the task, from infrastructure to education, um, it's huge. We would have to decide as a country that it's a priority. Um, uh, it's interesting in terms of tax, the conference board historically also fa favors consumption first. But get, I think before we get into the how-to you're going to create the wealth, there's one other side too. We have to also look at where we're spending. Uh, we have a major initiative out on health because as we go forward, if we're not careful, it will take up most of the amount. And these issues are linked. Mm -hmm. The lady with the snowflake gets the last word. Thanks everybody for this discussion <laughs> today. Bill Curry from Deloitte, good to have you on the program for the first time. Michael Marin, Action Fellow, Action Canada Fellow, also with the University of Ottawa, Armin Yalnesian, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, and Golden from the Conference Board of Canada, and Jim Milway from the Martin Prosperity Institute. Good discussion, everybody. Thanks so much.